Hey everyone, welcome to another podcast of Sustain Our Software, SOS. Here we talk about all the things related to open source sustainability and how we can make the world a better place in that fashion. Today on our panel, we have a guest panelist, a good friend of mine, Nathan Hopkins. How you doing, Nate? I'm doing good. Awesome. Nate is a, uh, a panelist on the Ruby Rogues podcast that I used to be on, so I'm very excited to have Nate here. I am Eric Berry, and uh, today our guest is Laura Gaetano. Am I pronouncing that right, Laura? Yeah, you're pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> awesome. Laura, welcome to the show. We really appreciate you coming on. I believe that we found you, or you found us, or actually we found you because you were a, uh, an attendee of Sustain Summit last year. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. I, no, I so attended let's... the conference and I had a great time. So, yeah. <laughs> the thing that I believe most about top notch developers is that they're constantly learning. Whether you're out watching videos, whether you're reading blog posts or books, whether you're out writing open source software, you're always out there learning how to be a better developer. And my friends at Thinkster and I teamed up and we put together a show called the DevEd Podcast. You can find it at devedpodcast.com. It's run by Joe Eames, who you might know from JavaScript Jabber, Adventures in Angular, and Views on View. And they have terrific conversations about what it means to become a better developer, to learn how to do development, and the ways that you can learn. So if you're looking for inspiration, and ideas about how you can do better and learn better as a developer, then go check out the DevEd podcast. Tell us a little bit about your background, a little bit about yourself, and what led you to the point where we're talking today. Okay, so I'll make a long story short. I'm a developer and designer. I'm currently based in Berlin, Germany, but I've lived in Austria before, and I'm originally from Italy. So that kind of gives you a little bit of, of background as to like where I've been and grown up. I'm originally from the Ruby community, so that's kind of where I got started as a developer and, you know, worked at a consulting company. And now I'm in my last couple of weeks at Travis Foundation, where I've moved sort of into a a management role. So I did community management, project management, and have supported a team of direct reports that I had. So I've been a little bit everywhere and done a little bit of everything. Uh, So what was your experience like in the community management side of Travis? So I was focusing primarily on the foundation side of things. So a nonprofit foundation that Travis CI started a few years back to give back to the open source community. And my role was primarily in, in running and supporting the community that we have around Rails Go Summer of Code, which is one of our biggest, uh, biggest projects at Travis Foundation. And I don't know, my, my experience, I guess, was overwhelming of like, it was incredible to just see how much excitement there was about the program that we've been running for six years now and how much enthusiasm in kind of giving back to the community and supporting, you know, supporting diversity in in open source and in software in general. I'm not sure that this kind of really answered the question. Oh, it absolutely No, I appreciate that. I'm I'm a big fan of uh, the Rails Girls uh, project, the Rails Girls community. We live in Utah, Nate and I do, and we're both Rubyists. Uh, we've both been Rubyists for, I think, over 10 years and have built our, our whole uh, career on top of that. So it's, it's always fascinating to hear other people who are still engaged in the Ruby community. It seems that oftentimes people discount the Rails and Ruby community as something that's going away. But in reality, for me, I think it's one of the best, best languages and frameworks that we can work with. Nate, I'm sure you don't have an opinion on that at all. <laughs> Nope, I fell in love with Ruby and I've never left. So, given your background with with Travis, with uh, the Ruby development community, and what challenges is Rails Girls facing that uh, to, we can talk about? Um, so, m- maybe I want to like make a distinction between sort of Rails Girls as an organization. So, the organization that kind of runs the Rails Girls chapters around the world and the Summer of Code program, which is kind of a little bit separate. So, Rails Girls has been started by people, by Linda Lucas, um, who wrote the Hell Ruby book, among other things, and started this chapter in Finland, I think. And then it just kind of like spread 
spread a little bit around the world. And the Summer of Code program is sort of a little bit separate. Um, so maybe I would I would focus on the challenges that the Summer of Code program is um, is facing right now, simply because that's what I know best, I guess, if that makes sense. So when we started Summer of Code, the landscape in open source and I think in software in general in the Ruby community looked a little different. So, you know, six, seven years ago, you didn't have as many programs that were trying to support to openly support diversity in open source and in software and in the Ruby community. There were certainly a few, but not as many. And so I think there's been like a lot of development, and this is a good thing. There's been so much development when it comes to people starting programs and focusing on on different different types of participants and attendees and all that. And I think what we as a program have been, some of the challenges that we've been facing is a lack of resources, I guess, for one, which is something that you hear in like open source a lot. And this means money. This means people who are invested long time, um, like over a long period of time. This also means, I guess, when you start a program in the same way that we've started our program. So like it, it's kind of a small thing that a grassroots thing that just kind of grows. You focus less on structure and you just want to kind of get stuff going and get things started. And you forget about documenting things, you forget about knowledge management, you forget about, you know, giving people roles and responsibilities, and everyone just kind of jumps in and does the stuff that needs doing. And further down the line, you then realize, okay, we have six years of a program that we've been running, and we haven't maybe done a great job at documenting, you know, what what our past participants are up to. So I think this is the biggest problem the biggest challenge that we're facing right now is kind of trying to figure out like six years down the line, A, where our place is in the community. Is there still space for us as a program? You know, there was six years ago, but now the landscape has changed. And the second challenge is sort of, okay, we we want to we want to make sure that the knowledge that we've accumulated is documented well so that it can actually serve the community and not just our small um, group of volunteers and and organizers. One thought um, that I've got about what you guys are doing is it pertains to open source. You know, as you move through your career as a uh, if you're if you're a programmer, you oftentimes will will see multiple companies. You may participate in multiple projects, whether those are open source or not. But what really sticks is the relationships and the friendships that you build along the way. That's what I really love about what your effort is here. And yeah, I haven't really considered it personally, the types of challenges that you face in making that aspect of it sustainable. That's the part of this whole thing that actually has staying power, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you talk about, you know, the relationships that we build, like that's been one thing that. I've been working on this project now for five years and five years is actually a long time. Like in tech terms, it's a super long time. And to know that some of the people, some of the sponsors, some of the the people at companies who supported us five years ago are still the same people, are still the same contacts that we have today is actually amazing if you think about it. Because people in our in our world tend to like not stay at a company for longer than five years. But I've had the chance and the privilege to meet, for example, also some of our participants who, you know, participated three years ago and are now developers and being able to like meet them in person and find out on what a great path, they, career path they've been and how they've developed and how grateful they are to the program, to us um, for for the program existing is, yeah, it's just, it's amazing. And it's, it's something that you don't often get when you work in open source is that the kind of human contact, I guess. You work a lot through screens and asynchronously and on GitHub and everything, but like that that meeting in person and just finding out what people are doing is amazing. 
It is pretty exciting to to have some of those touch points with with other people and building those relationships. So I've got some very small open source work that that is starting to garner a little bit of attention, and I've got people reaching out to me just in back channels or Slack or, or email, and it's just kind of fun to to put something into the world and then have people express their excitement and desire to participate. I can imagine it's only ten times better when you actually help them become a developer or improve their skill set. Yeah, but I think as an individual, it's also already kind of super exciting to have that feedback when you've built something on your own, right? Like just people reaching out, people who are strangers and being like, hey, your project is helping me. Thank you. Or, hey, I have some suggestions that I'd like to make or some contributions. I think that's that's amazing because it's kind of that's pretty much what open source is all about, right? Um, about the the collaborative aspect of it all and not reinventing the wheel at the end of the day. So, Yeah, I wonder if, if it seems like some projects hit a tipping point where they have to become a bit more commercialized in terms of being able just to manage like the, the backlog of issues or feature requests, that sort of thing. Just the overhead, uh, you know, the, the, the management overhead on a single project can be can be pretty large once it gains a certain level of popularity. One of the things that we talked about a little bit before the show that I want to get into, and you've mentioned it a couple of times already, is uh, regarding diversity and inclusion within the open source community. Nate and I both live in an area that is probably one of the most least diverse places in the United States. In fact, Provo, which is not too far away from where both of us live, is actually the least diverse city in the nation. Also, we live in a state where women get paid 68% of what men get paid for the same job. We're facing these issues here in our community, but I'd like to know from your view, how does that impact or, or what's the current state that you see of diversity and inclusion within the open source community? So I think there's definitely been some work done towards improving diversity and thinking about inclusion in open source. There's different initiatives that have been focusing on that or have been trying to raise these issues and improve them. Um, as an example, there's there's an initiative called Open Source Diversity. It's opensourcediversity.org. So I know some of the people who have um, who have started this initiative and their idea is basically to create an online community for people who are interested in improving the status quo of both diversity and inclusion in open source. And they do so by providing resources, by having an open forum where people can talk about things or ask questions and kind of, yeah, talk about things. But so there's certainly from the individual perspective, like a lot of some, some, a lot of individuals who get involved and talk about it. And there's been talks at conferences. I myself have also um, given a couple of talks at certain conferences to, to discuss this issue and certain practices and kind of improving uh, inclusion for, for people's open source projects. But I think there's also something that I've noticed for example, sort of the move, the move of, of platforms that we use to host code like GitHub towards making us more aware of the things that we still need in order to make a project a, a bit more inclusive in order to kind of think about the types of contributors that we want to attract. And I think it shows, like it, it sends a big message to say like, okay, as a platform where a ton of open source projects are hosted, you know, we'll have um, an overview of all the things that you can do in order to improve your community. I think GitHub recently kind of um, added this feature, the community feature where you can sort of see or your social impact kind of um, the social impact feature. I don't know what it's called, but it's basically an overview of all the things that you might want to add to your project in order to make it better, more inclusive. So that includes, you know, a contribution guidelines that includes a, a readme and such things. And I think that's important because we can talk a lot about what individuals can do and what 
famous people in communities can do in order to raise more awareness. But at the end of the day, like if companies and if platforms, if products that we use don't actually also make that step of like moving towards showing that diversity and inclusion are important, it's going to be really hard for us as individuals to just kind of make a change. I agree with you. I actually, so we have a couple of links that we're going to drop in the show notes that that are referencing what you're talking about. I got to say kudos to to GitHub for for taking this initiative. It's a, a huge step. Back in 2017, you gave a talk um, called Open Source Needs You. In the talk, you, you discussed different types of, of contributions to open source. Now, most of the time when, when you think of, hey, I want to be, I want to contribute to the community, I want to contribute to open source, it always goes to code. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> so, okay, as someone who's, who has a background in, in the visual arts, that's what I studied originally, and who's kind of super excited about knowledge sharing and knowledge management, I would love to see the practice of basically of crowdsourcing knowledge and of crowdsourcing information, designs, all of that in, in other roles that aren't the role of the programmer. So I think for, for programmers, the idea of contributing to open source and contributing code to open source is something that is by now like fairly common. People talk about it a lot in, in job interviews, whether that's a good thing or not in the sense of whether that's, whether looking at your GitHub profile and deciding whether or not you're a good fit for the job is something different. But the fact that we talk so openly about being okay with volunteering our time to make a project that is an hour's better, I think is great. And I would love to see that in, in sort of other parts of the industry. I think it's important to recognize the value of contributions that are in code because projects aren't just about code, right? Like we've spent a little bit of time now talking about community and the importance of community and the importance of this networking. And if you don't have people putting time and effort into reaching out to the community, into doing marketing work, into documenting the project so that it's friendly to people who maybe have never touched code. I think it's really hard to keep a project going and to also to kind of argue this project is actually worth, you know, putting funding into, it's worth putting money into, it's worth spreading and and talking about because at the end of the day, like I also think that open source shouldn't just, or these projects that we focus on in open source should not be just about code and that other contributions should be recognized. That's true in business as well, right? I mean, it takes kind of takes a village to make it all happen, especially to, to build something that's very successful. You, you need people wearing different hats, playing different roles, contributing in different ways. The one thought that I had is, is you've kind of touched on all these various aspects of community and creating an environment that cultivates good community and different types of contributions, whether that's writing or, I mean, who, who knows what it might be, right? It, there's all, all sorts of ways to contribute to an open source project. But it's it's made me think of this, not that long ago, there was kind of this Twitter storm around the, the notion of 10x developers and people were piling on this guy. And so I've got some thoughts about that. But in general, I mean, I think the consensus is that there's not really a 10x individual or you shouldn't focus your energy there. You should focus your energy on creating a 10x environment. And, and in my mind, that's, that's where, I mean, that, you know, on the subject of sustainability, you want to build a project that has staying power and can truly thrive building a 10x environment by creating, you know, a friendly place where a community can, can grow, I think is the way to do that. Yeah. I think you're preaching to the choir for me. Like I, yeah, I totally agree with you. It's super important. And I think, Maybe like one of the reasons why we tend to look so much at things like code contributions as being, you know, more important than other types of contributions is also because they live, they they leave some sort of a trace. Like I've been thinking about from the management perspective, if you're a project manager, like how is your work visible? And it's really hard to make some of that work visible if you're working on a project. I mean, what you're doing is like you're managing the project, you're 
helping to manage the people. As a people manager, you you also have very few, let's say, visible traces that you can hold up and say like, hey, this is the work that I've done this week. And to be perfectly honest, that's also something that frustrated me a little bit in my manager role was that I didn't have those checkboxes to tick. I, I couldn't have that to-do list and be like, okay, this has been done. This has been done. These are my achievements. And so I think maybe maybe we have that perspective still of the stuff that makes us productive is the stuff that we can see on paper and or on screen. So code, for example, and it's much, much harder to to make marketing work or community work or networking or HR type work visible. I'd like to take a step back a little bit. One of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about that you, that you mentioned before is around mental health in open source. This is something that I've, I've seen firsthand a lot of experience with, but I, I'd like to, to hear your input on, on that. And how can we make sure that we're in a great mental state? How can we support those with mental health issues when it comes to being able to continue to do what we're doing? I'm definitely not an expert on this. I've been thinking about this topic a lot because so I realized one of the reasons why I found it fairly hard to do my work lately is because I, I feel a little bit burned out. And I think we've, so many of us have had that feeling before of, I just, I can do a lot of things in my day to day, but I just, I can't get myself to sit down and write that one email, or I can't get myself to look through these pull requests or like just looking at this list of issues gives me anxiety. And, and so I've been rethinking a lot of my work or a lot of like how I approach work. And I guess why it took me so long to kind of face the idea that I might be burning out. And I think it's because we have this idea of burnout as like this, this thing that happens to you and then you, you feel it like, and then, you know, I'm completely worn out. I can't do anything. I can't get up. I can't shower. I can't, I, I can't do anything, but I've been doing things. I just have found it really hard to focus on certain parts of my work. So uh, this brings me to answering your question, which is, I think we need to talk more about our experiences. And I think we need to have a better understanding of what different mental health issues are, uh, because I think there's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding around, you know, what depression looks like, what anxiety looks like, what burnout looks like, also what things like ADHD look like and how they affect us and how they affect different types of people differently, for example. One of the initiatives that up until recently we supported with Travis Foundation is Prompt, which is a really great initiative that focuses on kind of bringing the awareness of mental health topics to tech conferences. And so they do so by supporting speakers financially to kind of talk at tech conferences and talk about their experiences. And I think that's super important. And then, of course, down the line, we can also talk about how we put in place ways in which we don't get burned out. So that look that may look like, you know, avoiding like talking about the bus factor and talking about knowledge management and making sure that all of the effort doesn't fall onto one person. But I think it also means thinking about or trying to push for more support when it comes to like healthcare and, you know, therapy being paid for or trying to find ways in which we can finance things that as a society help us feel better and help us avoid depression and burnout or help us deal deal with those things. Like it's not just in tech, right? It's a, it's a societal issue as a whole. And every country approaches this differently also when it comes to healthcare. Like it's a, it's a really big, it's a really big, it's a huge like monumental issue, I guess. I was curious if you think that developers are more susceptible to some of those, uh, you know, some mental health challenges, as, especially as a project grows or as they change their role, right? So as you said, developers are so used to having artifacts produced 
And oftentimes they'll you know, view their own productivity based on, did I produce the thing, right? But as you take on more responsibilities or play different roles within an organization or within a project, you get less of the checkbox, you know, kind of yeah. workflow. And I'm just wondering if you think that that contributes to a higher risk factor maybe for developers as they, as they start to do less development. Or if they, even if they're still like full all in on development, they just get pulled away. Like there, I, there's been several times in my career where, you know, I've, I've been pulled into meetings or I had to, you know, do a lot of administrative type work, but I was also still responsible for the code. And there were days where I would go home and had not cut any significant code and would just feel like I had not done anything. And then I would work all night because I felt like I hadn't delivered. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Like I've been in other industries so little. Um, so I, I also, I worked in the music industry for a while. And so I think as humans, we always tend to think that our experience is sort of unique in a way. And so I wonder if sometimes we haven't, we don't kind of approach this idea of like, mental health issues and think, okay, well, in our industry, it's just more common or in certain roles, it's more common than in other industries or other roles. I think there's definitely some things about being a developer that contribute to, you know, to being a higher risk than other roles. But I think maybe this is also something that's true of all what's called, I don't know, knowledge workers, right? Like all people who kind of focus so much on I don't know, who don't work with their hands or who, you know, who spend a lot of time in front of the computer, who work a lot on like cerebral tasks and such. So it it could be that it's both that. And sometimes I also think that maybe it's a societal thing as well, that it that our society is just moving more in that direction at the same time. I don't know. I just think maybe we never had the means to research research like mental health issues 200 years ago. And so we don't know. Yeah, yeah. We don't know how it was back then. Yeah. So I think that's a super interesting. About 10 months before we started Ruby Rogues, which is the oldest podcast on devchat.tv, I went freelance. And one of the things that I figured out pretty fast is that I had no idea what I was doing. And I made a bunch of mistakes, but I also made a bunch of friends who were doing freelance and we got together and we started a podcast called The Freelancer Show. And the Freelancer Show has been running about as long as JavaScript Jabber. But we talk every week about all of the things that we were learning and doing in freelancing and giving people advice on how to get their business started so that they could go out and be independent if that's what they wanted. Nowadays, I'm not on the show anymore, but we have terrific people like Ruben Lerner and Eric Dietrich that come on every week and talk to you about how they run their businesses and give other perspectives on things that you can do. So whether it's how to find clients or whether it's how to step in and start doing training or other programs, or how to run a business. They have a ton of experience, and they talk about all kinds of things that are going to help you pull things together and be successful as a freelancer. So whether you're thinking about moonlighting and trying it out, or whether you're going whole hog and quitting your job, you should definitely check out The Freelancer Show. And you can find that at freelancershow.com. How important is it to, to get a thank you or recognition when it comes to burnout? Maybe not even burnout. Maybe when, um, so my guess is not, I'm not, I don't write a lot of open source projects. I contribute, but I don't, I'm not a maintainer of anything. And um, I'm wondering how important is it for somebody to hear a thank you? And I'll qualify this a little bit by, by saying that before I started Code Sponsor and Code Fund back in the day, I found that if a developer just earns just a tiny bit of money, and that tiny bit of money doesn't, it's, it's negligible, right? But the fact that there's a tiny bit of money coming in, then they feel like, oh, there's something giving back. There's somebody who cares enough. How important is that for you in your work? So I think it's fairly important. Like I noticed, I mean, I've, t I've talked about kind of talking to past participants of Rose Girl Summer of Code, for example, and, and hearing their story and basically them telling that them telling me their story and saying hey this program really helped me is equivalent to them saying thank you for helping with this thank you for running this thank you for working on this thank you for enabling me to to follow my career dream and 
every single time I go to an event and I hear that it it gives me a little bit more strength, right? To kind of keep going. It just, it makes me feel like, okay, then we're not doing this work in vain. This has been useful. And of course, you know, we talk, we talk a lot about grand gestures and like, what are things that make a difference? And sometimes small gestures are enough. I think unless you've experienced that moment where you're exhausted and don't want to keep going anymore. And then someone comes and says, Hey, thank you for doing this. You don't realize just how much of a difference it can make. Yeah, that's, that's how I feel as well. I follow Matt Friedman, who's the, the now owner or not owner, the CEO of GitHub. And a proposal was made to integrate into GitHub a new type of pull request, I believe. I mean, maybe it's not a pull request, but an issue type. And one of them is a thank you issue, which I find absolutely incredible. If somebody could just come in and create an issue that's a thank you. What a fantastic idea. Another thing that comes to mind at the, the Mountain West Ruby Conf back in 2016, I, I attended that. And one of the speakers, it was the first time I've, I've heard uh, of mental health discussed um, at a conference. And the speaker was James, James Buck, who is originally from Utah, but he also uh, is a core developer with the with Basecamp. Fantastic guy, huge, huge uh, contributor and maintainer. Most Rubyists have used his his open source work in the past. But he talked about he wrote an article that I that I'll share in the show notes called "To Smile Again," which uh, covers basically his whole experience of a burnout to where it hit him so bad that I believe he took off eight or nine months and just had to completely remove himself. The amount of stress that gets placed on these maintainers is, is crazy. I, I, this is one of the reasons why, why Nate and I started Code Fund is because, uh, funny, even though it's not a solution to, to open source sustainability and happiness and, and, and a solution to burnout, it does contribute to that area to where, okay, well, I'm getting some money, so at least I can justify I can justify a little bit of the stress that I'm feeling. It's not a hundred percent me giving up myself. What factor do you feel that funding plays in in burnout? I think it's definitely true when when you say that you know having at least a little bit so doing volunteer work that is unpaid versus doing work that will in some way be be financially supported, you know, can make a difference. So also the idea of, you know, GitHub introducing sponsors, for example, and, and giving the possibility to give money to the maintainers of projects. And yeah, so there's, I mean, the PS Collective as well, enabling people to get money or to to make sort of the the financial aspect of open source visible and so i think it's important but i think there's kind of it's it's a bit of a double edged sword i feel because then from the moment that money is involved you feel greater responsibility to actually get the work done and so I think that can sometimes have the opposite effect, which is it just kind of pushes you more towards burnout because you say, or towards exhaustion, because you say like, I, someone give me money for this. So maybe they now feel even more entitled to having my time or to me, you know, getting this work done. And I think there's, there's been like a little bit of talk around the entitlement of sort of the community when it comes to maintainers maybe not not closing issues quickly enough or not resolving issues quickly enough and i think adding money to that equation can can become like a really tricky business because yeah it it just adds on responsibility i do i do agree with that i've had first hand experience with a lot of a lot of people that work with us a lot of maintainers that say that once money in, is introduced it does change the dynamic a little bit However, one of the reasons why I feel that I think that your statement probably needs to be qualified a little bit where the, where the money, you know where you're getting it from. Basically, there's a contract or, or a social contract or whatever it might be from the person that you're getting, the, the company or person that you're getting the money from to 
to you. Now, the sponsors program that GitHub offers does not have that anonymous factor in a way, but it also, I don't think it comes with any strings. Uh, direct sponsorship, however, does typically come with come with that. And we see that a lot with Open Collective where we have large companies that are donating to specific projects. And it's possible that those projects or the, the maintainers feel that they need to make sure that they're on top of things, specifically to make sure that that money continues coming in. My view uh, on this is that's that's one of the most beautiful things about advertising is that advertising has nothing to do with a relationship between the maintainer and the advertiser. It has everything to do with the relationship between the maintainer with the maintainer's audience and the advertiser. And so, therefore, there is no there is no sense of a responsibility or any anything that the maintainer might owe the advertiser. If, of course, that it's not a direct relationship between the two. Anyway, I, I do think a lot about this, but it, it is interesting. I'm actually pushing really, really hard with the GitHub sponsors team to, to introduce a, 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 an ethical ad, basically a very, very small ethical ad, a sponsorship into GitHub where the money that's generated from that goes directly to that project in, to help fund that project. To me, that seems like a fantastic solution that wouldn't require anybody to specifically say, okay, well, if this person's a sponsor, that means they're going to help to break this project. That's not the case at all. Anyway, that's that's where my mind is a lot. <laughs> uh, we've talked about a lot of stuff. I don't want to, to miss anything else out, but uh, I think we covered a lot. Is there anything else that you would like to go over? Anything that we haven't talked about that maybe you'd like to share with the audience? I mean, I think as you say, like we have covered a lot of ground and we could definitely go way more into depth on any one of those subjects that could take up a whole podcast by itself. <laughs> well, so, we'll have yeah. to have you back on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think that would be about it for me. And I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to start conversations about some of these topics with some of the listeners if they're interested in going more in depth into any of this. I think that could be kind of like a good way of continuing this conversation. How can people find you online? I'm Alice Tragedy pretty much everywhere. So Twitter, GitHub. Yeah. What else is there? <laughs> um, those are the two, the two services that I, that I mostly use nowadays. So Fantastic. Where did Alice Tragedy come from? Ah, that's an interesting question. So uh, I said briefly before that I come from the visual arts and I, when I was studying art, I kind of, I was, I was producing a lot of things and I figured out, okay, if I'm an artist, I have to have like an artist's name, you know, not use my real name because that's boring. And I used to really love Alice in Wonderland when I was a kid and when I was younger and I just kind of loved how whimsical it was. And because I was 18 or 19 and you're always super kind of tragic and I was listening to a lot of emo music, I thought that Alice Tragedy might be kind of like a good artist name. And then that just kind of stuck. Yeah. I'm, I can also be found at alicetragedy.org, um, which is my, my website, even though I haven't, <laughs> I haven't updated it in a really long time. So maybe this is kind of my cue to um, finish the website redesign that I've been working on for the last year. Yeah, but that's kind of how I picked the name. I love it. You know, with the name Eric Berry, <laughs> that is not a stage name by any means. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of nice when your real name sounds like one, right? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. So thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. You've been a fantastic guest. You have a fascinating background. And for those listening that that can't view, this has been somewhat of an emotional conversation. There's been some some emotions shown. And this is definitely a, a, a discussion from the heart. And I appreciate you being vulnerable in that it, during this talk, Laura. We've been recording Ruby Rogue since 2011, and we've talked to a lot of people who have had a really deep influence, not only on the programming community, but also on the Ruby community. And as we've talked to these people, it's become apparent to me that we talk a lot about the things that make them interesting that they've done. But we don't really get into how they got into programming, 
or how they came up in their career, how they got to be the person who invented whatever library or, or technique that they came on the show to talk about. And so I put together a show where we actually highlight these things. We talk to them about how they got into programming. We talk to them about how they got into Ruby, maybe how they got into Rails. We get a little bit deep into what makes them tick and why they are the way they are. And then we talk about what they're working on. We talk about the things that make them well-known or make them interesting. And a lot of times, it's the stuff that goes beyond the code that really makes these people tick and makes them the kind of people that we want to hear about. And so I put together a show called My Ruby Story. You can find it at myrubystory.com. And it's where I interview these people and just get the stories of these people and how they came into programming. So if you want to hear inspirational stories or get ideas on how you can actually advance your career, then go check it out at myrubystory.com. So the next step that we have in our podcast is picks. Now, for those who don't know, picks are when all of our panelists and guests choose one to three things that are very interesting at the time. They could be anything like, uh, you know, what they had for, for lunch yesterday. They could be a book or a podcast or a video that they've seen or a TV show or maybe some, some, some gadget that they purchased, whatever it might be. So we're going to go ahead and start off on picks. I'll start us off. Today, I only have one pick, but I'm really excited about this. Now, for those who know me, I like to explore every possible solution out there for a problem. I'm, I love digging into all of these different solutions. Like when I choose a CRM, I got to try every one of them. When I choose an email client, I got to try every one of them. And it's no different when it comes to website generation. Running a small company, it's really hard for us to stay on top of content without some sort of dynamic process to, to do so. So we started off with WordPress, realized that we really are not WordPress people. Nothing against WordPress, but I've, I've gone through and tried all these different types of uh, static generators and website creators and all that stuff. And the one that we landed on, which I'm very, very excited about, is Webflow, webflow.com. Now, Webflow is not a sponsor of this podcast, although they should be. What they allow you to do is get in and create content very easily through drag and drop. And they also have built-in hosting, export to static, static sites and all that stuff. But the most interesting part that I find is that they take on the cloning idea from GitHub, where somebody could put up either components for websites or they can put up complete websites and make those clonable or forkable in a way. So now when I go in to create this website, I can go to this complete marketplace that has all of these components and everything and just kind of pull in what I want. Fascinating idea. It's almost like a, a community of contributors inside the design sphere. So I'm very excited to, to have been introduced to that. I'm excited to be using it. And we're going to be moving the CodeFund uh, marketing site to Webflow shortly. Nate, how about you? Uh, for me, I'm sure you've picked this before, but... Uh... Since uh, they just released an up update to this, I'm going to pick Metabase. So we just upgraded to the newest version of Metabase, which is essentially a business intelligence tool where you can self-serve, you know, non-technical or less technical people can go in and, and query your database once you just plug it in. It's kind of a drag and drop, uh, point and click, WYSIWYG type thing. So it's very friendly to those folks, but it's also a power tool. So if you need to drop in and write your own SQL and save off little snippets of queries and save segments and all that kind of stuff and make it easy for the rest of the team to kind of see what's happening in your system. It's a fantastic tool and it's open source and free. The upgrade has made it feel snappier and, and faster. And uh, yeah, I'm, I love that tool. I've used it at like th my last three companies. So it's, it's really fantastic. The other pick I've got, is as uh, kind of more of a uh, it's it's not technical at all it's it's trees so I just recently planted some trees in my backyard because I'm ho hoping to get a privacy a fast privacy hedge propped up between me and my neighbor and we chose at the early in early spring we bought some trees called willow hybrids or hybrid willows and they were just pencil thin little sticks of of a tree with barely a root system we planted them and now that were, you know, approaching fall, or at least at the end of the summer here, they've probably tripled in size, maybe quadrupled. It's, it's crazy. So here's hoping next year we actually have some privacy. That's incredible. I tried to plant a tree in our front yard, and it was very sad and pathetic that I literally was able to go out in the front yard, pull the tree, and it came right out of the ground. So 
I'm, I'm glad you got a green thumb because I do not. Laura, let's hear your picks. Yeah, so I have a couple of picks. My first pick is a person. I'm not sure if that's unusual or not. But yes, yeah, so I've been looking at the work of uh, Jocelyn K. Gly a lot yeah, over the last year or so. So she has a podcast and an online course, which I recently taken at the beginning of the year. And what I love about everything that she does pretty much is that she focuses a lot on the idea of creativity and resilience and productivity, but not, I guess, not the negative productivity that we associate with sort of like hustling and doing everything 10 times faster and just being better, stronger and whatnot. So on her podcast, she has a lot of interesting guests that talk also about vulnerable topics. And I I love that because I love the approach that she takes with all of her work, which is that in order to be more productive in a positive way, you have to be slow and look at things and analyze things. And that's something that I've really appreciated over the last months. And that has kind of helped me to gain some perspective in my work and think about kind of how I work. And I suppose to a certain extent, that's also related to sustainability. So yeah, that's that's my first pick. I can highly recommend the podcast. And my second pick is a newsletter. I know that I guess 99% of us don't need more newsletters in our lives and would rather have less than more. But what I like a lot about this newsletter is that it feels more like a short blog post than kind of an overwhelming list of articles that you should be reading, but will not have the time to read. And so this uh, newsletter is called The Bulletin by a designer and developer called Carolina. This newsletter comes out fairly irregularly and not, um, you know, not every week or so. So there's been, I think, four this year. So I don't know, every couple of months. And it's a short article on a random topic. And in fact, I think the last topic was um, quitting, which is super interesting for me, given that I recently um, quit my job. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I could totally relate. And I love the way um, she writes about things. And the best part of the uh, about the newsletter is that it's not the type of newsletter that you kind of like dump in your uh, newsletter folder in your inbox and never open again, but you actually read it and then archive it. It's great. Yeah, and if I may have a third pick. Yeah, that's good. So uh, I recently finished reading Design for Real Life by Eric Meyer and... Sarah Wachter Böttcher, I think, is if you would pronounce it the German way. That's how you would pronounce it, probably. And it's a book from a list apart. So I love all of the books that they publish. I find them super interesting. And I think they're exciting for developers and designers alike. But what I love about this book is that it looks a lot at the way we build products and sort of digital experiences for users. And they use a lot of, like, it's a really actionable type of book. So they use real life examples to illustrate how we sometimes don't think about our users or about the range of users and the diversity of the users that we have. And it gives actionable suggestions on incorporating compassion into your design process. So it's fairly short and quick to read. Um, it's fairly to the point and it kind of gives you almost like a step-by-step -step on approaching designing a product and a better experience for users. Yeah, so those are my three picks, I guess. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. We will go ahead and wrap up the show. We'd like to thank our listeners for listening. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for sponsoring. We appreciate it. We love you guys. Thank you very much. And we will be back next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.